As followers of this channel will know, I've been anticipating and telling you about the replacement Speedmaster Professional, the Moonwatch, since March last year. Well, it's finally here, so let's look into the details. Now this is a long one, around 30 minutes, so go take a comfort break, grab a cup of tea and settle in. I'm Andy and welcome to the English Watch. Please check out my previous videos on the Speedmaster Professional. It's great to get a retrospective view on the old stuff and see what predictions I got right and which ones I got wrong. Please also don't forget to subscribe if you like this content. Now I leave an affiliate link in the description of these videos for any tools and equipment I've used in the production. Now I do get a small commission that really helps the channel grow, so really appreciate your support. My main reference is the Moonwatch Only book. You know, there's no better reference for a speedy fan. I'll also place some timestamps in the description and it'll take you through the evolution of the Speedmaster Professional from its inception in 1964. But if you just want to see my thoughts on the watch, yeah, you can jump to that section also. Now, if anyone is doubting the credentials of the Speedmaster's flight qualified status or its continued use in EVAs in the vacuum of space, take a look at these Russian cosmonauts from November 2020 doing an EVA around the ISS. The Speedmaster is still there being used as a genuine tool watch. It's now only used on the one-piece Russian Orlin Sea Eagle spacesuit, and capable of nine hours of spacewalks. Yes, it's still there, just not with NASA. Okay, on to the history lesson. Now, pay attention. I have a dream. I am the greatest. A superb runner, this man hates. So, the Omega Speedmaster Professional was originally launched back in 1964 with model reference ST105.012. This was the model that was chosen by NASA for the Apollo missions and the inspiration for the new 2021 case style. The Professional was an upgrade from the ST105003 that served on the Gemini missions and that was reimagined by Omega last year with the Ed White and included the historic 321 movement a movement that can trace its origins back to 1941 with the Lamania 27 Chrono C12 and used first in the Speedmaster model back in 1957. Now, just as Apollo 8 was making the first orbit around the moon back in 1968, Amiga gave the Speedmaster Professional its first significant upgrade, with a revised movement replacing the aging 321 with a more accurate and reliable movement known as 861. This was still true to the Lamania base calibre but ditched what was a difficult to manufacture and unreliable column wheel for a more reliable cam operation for the chronograph and also an increase in the beat rate from 18,000 to 21,600 vibrations per hour for improved accuracy. As we'll see in a minute, this has a bearing on a design feature of the 2021 dial. Now there was a blink and you'll miss it update prior to the movement change with the removal of the second bezel on the case back. Now make a note of that one. During this change point, the chronograph second hand was also changed, moving from a kite-shaped balance to the straight edge version we see today, while shrinking and moving the tip marker back towards the dial centre. Maybe something just subtle to inform that the watch had a new movement. So, back to 1968 and the model ST145.022 had a familiar face, but now with a new movement. Man hadn't even stepped on the moon yet, and were already pretty divergent from what is perceived as the moon watch. Moving into 1969, we see a further change, removing the applied Amiga logo that was the narrow pinch style with the printed logo that was wider and more like the one we recognise today. And one that has shaken the collective fraternity to the core, that little dot over 90 on the tachymeter slipped down the zero to about the two o'clock position. As Neil and Buzz were celebrating their successful return from the moon with their now obsolete model 105.012, in 1971 and to commemorate the Apollo moon landings and extend the life of this historical tool watch, the NASA marketing team added the famous words to the back of the case. Flight qualified by NASA for all manned space missions. The first watch worn on the moon. This was initially in what was known as the straight writing format, but was quickly changed to the medallion case back we see today and it reintroduced the Amiga Hippocampus emblem. The case back remained unchanged for over 40 years until 2017 and the 50th anniversary introduced the big box 
and the words Professional Moonwatch. I hope you'll take a note of the important features. There'll be a test at the end, mark my words. So we get to 1974, the last big design change to the dial, the removal of the step from the flat dial. Well, it's not really flat, but falls away from the outside rather than the previous step that bisected the minute markers. And there it remained until 2021, with just a few nips and tucks here and there, the most significant being a small upgrade in 1997 from the 861 movement to the now 1861, introducing rhodium plating and some bracelet refinements along the way. So, knowing all this, what do you think about what Omega have done for the 2021 model? The replacement of a watch that in essence has not changed since 1974. Well first, let's look a little closer to home and the Apollo 11 50th anniversary from 2019. On the still version we see the reintroduction of the ST105012 narrow case. The step dial used successfully with colour contrast to accentuate the detail. That kite shaped balance of the chronograph hand and the larger further outboard loom marker. The classic Omega logo and text of the dial and crown. A double bevel on the case back, a flat link bracelet as fitted to the ST105012, and yes, a dot over 90 on the tachymeter. Now, wouldn't it have been nice to wrap all this nostalgia around a 321 movement? But in this instance, Omega chose this watch to launch the new 3861 movement. So, with the Apollo 11, we have a heritage piece, something that celebrates the success of the moon landings in 1969. Not an exact copy, but something special for the enthusiasts who appreciate what all these features mean. A watch that features the significant design cues we all know, but adds to it some of Omega's newest technology, including the movement and the moonshine gold accents. Maybe as a celebration to one of the most complex machines ever created in the Saturn V launch vehicle. Now, as we saw earlier, Omega had the foresight back in 1971 to keep the Speedmaster Professional in the collection without change, and use the Moon Landings Association to their advantage. And it's no surprise then that the new 2021 version is not a complete redesign. In fact, Omega have been very canny with their development of the Speedmaster brand over the years and played a little to the audience with some great and not so great special editions. Omega know there's a fan base out there and they engage with it unlike other brands we won't mention. Now you could argue that the Porsche 911, despite its evolution, still looks the same. And it does, well, a little bit. Just as the Rolex Submariner is close to the model available at the time the Speedmaster went to the moon. But unlike the Speedmaster, the Submariner has grown up, got a job, bought a shiny suit and a pair of shoes and enjoys its factory fresh 992. The Omega on the other hand still knocks about in that classic 911. It's been restored, it's got new tyres and the engine's had a real good tune and upgrade. Now these analogies are of course nonsense, but you know, help us tell a story. One that maybe helps the ordinary punter on the street who may not know the long history behind the Speedmaster and why it's been frozen in time like Captain America. So, what have we got then? The old version was available in two flavours. The traditional Hesslite plexiglass crystal with a solid medallion case back and 1861 movement. That is seen as the Moonwatch to purists, like me. And it continues to see action in space, although more likely on the arm of a Russian cosmonaut now. The use of the Hesslite crystal gives it a vintage aesthetic as well as function as it won't shatter in zero G. And also the sapphire sandwich. This has a sapphire crystal on the front and back and has a decorated version of the 1861 movement on display, calibre 1863. This is a great everyday choice with its additional refinements and the view of that movement. The box section sapphire crystal is expensive to replace and it does lose some of the visual aspects of the Hesselite. Both of these came with steel bracelets and black crocodile straps and shared the same dial layout. In the new lineup, we still have the Hesslite and the Sapphire Sandwich derivatives, but this time they're joined by a couple of boutique-only gold models. One in Omega's Sedona Gold at nearly £30,000, and one in something called Canopus Gold at nearly £40,000. Now this is a form of gold alloy from Omega, and named after the second brightest star in the sky. A giant white star mainly visible to the Southern Hemisphere in the constellation of Carina, a star with a key navigational role over the centuries. Now gold is no stranger to the Speedmaster range, but these two are novelties that few of us will handle, let alone own. So we'll concentrate on the steel, and besides, that's what you came here for, right? The Hesslite can be had with a canvas scrap similar to that on the Silver Snoopy 45th anniversary, with the steel deployment buckle and the sapphire version with a grain leather strap in lieu of the crocodile leather fitted previously. 
both steel versions are around £1,000 more than their equivalents. But given the additional refinements has always been a steel at this price, it's no surprise that Omega have used this change point to align more with the competition. I mean a Brightly Navitimer and Chronomat go for nearly £7,000, so these are still great value watches. Now don't expect discounts anytime soon. I do hear that Amiga are starting to clamp down on this practice on particular models, especially in stores with no other local Omega competition. We'll see how this gets on in a year or so, when these are nearly in every shop window and there's something shiny to take the spotlight away. All models are covered by Omega's 5 year warranty, but it's unclear what the service interval for this new one will be. Now don't forget, if you're enjoying this, please leave a few comments and hit that subscribe button. Now it's no surprise that Omega have fitted this watch with a new coaxial master chronometer. The George Daniels coaxial escapement has been industrialised and refined over the years by Omega and is now a significant part of their DNA. Manual wine chronographs remain popular with collectors and enthusiasts alike and this one has just got better. Amiga have re-engineered the Calibre 1861 to incorporate the new escapement, but along the way have also introduced a number of other refinements. It's still manual wind, the most significant being the introduction of a hack in seconds, an additional complication in itself. The power reserve has been raised a couple of hours to 50. The new Calibre retains the 1861 beat rate of 21,600 vibrations per hour, or about 3 Hz. Then comparing it to the outgoing movement, the dual count is up to 26 from 18, as this is now a master chronometer, we now benefit from the extreme anti-magnetism at 15,000 Gauss, effectively anti-magnetic thanks to that silicon balance spring. We also get much more improved accuracy, now MATAS certified and regulated to run within 0 to plus 5 seconds per day. The old movement wasn't even cost certified but did run pretty well despite being only certified at minus 1 to plus 11 seconds per day. This accuracy is in part helped by the addition of a free sprung balance as opposed to the old regulated balance. And this uses counterweights on the balance spring that vary the inertia to achieve the correct rate and are less susceptible to knocks and bangs, but also more a challenge to the watchmaker. This movement also finally sees the end of the Derlin brake, a controversial plastic part used in the closed caseback version. And as you can see from the image of this 861 movement, there's plenty of DNA left from that original Lamani movement. The case is the same as that used on the Apollo 11 50th anniversary and the Silver Snoopy 50th anniversary. It's inspired by the 4th generation model or ST105.012. The case is made from 316L stainless steel. It comes up at 42mm in diameter, has a lug to lug of 47mm and thickness wise the Hesselite version is 1358 and the sapphire slightly slimmer at 13.18 millimeters. Now this still isn't an ideal swim watch with water resistance remaining at 50 meters. Now there does appear to be a slightly longer and squarer crown that hopefully will make winding this new movement a bit easier than the old one. And this is helped by reprofiling of the pushers. Without having the watches in hand with a set of verniers, it's difficult to say where all of the changes are. The bezel stays an aluminium insert, no move to ceramic as on the anniversary models. This ensures the watch maintains the authentic look and keeps the price down. The bezel is nestled within the steel retaining ring and is well protected from scratches and scuffs. Where the bezel does move on is that pesky dot moving back over that number 90, but also dot under 70 moving back to about the 4 o'clock position. Ok, the case back. Now let's start with one aspect I got fundamentally wrong. In the leaked images we saw a new text on the reverse of the Hesselite model referring to flight qualified by NASA for all human space missions, a change from the all manned space missions text. Well it's not strictly my fault, but you know what, that's the price you pay for not using official material. Someone at Amiga is clearly having a laugh, or given how plausible this could have all been, there was a change of heart at the last minute. Either way I think it was a deliberate leak just to get us all talking about the launch. Well it worked didn't it? As with the Snoopy and the Apollo 11, the case gets back that second bevel and retains the overall design with the hippocampus at the centre. Fortunately, the NIAD lock text and alignment markers have not been carried forward. The Omega Globe squirrel has moved from the case back to the rear of one of the lugs to make room for the text. Unchanged since 1971 other than the addition of Professional Moonwatch in 2014. Now has the words coaxial master chronometer added to account for the new movement. Fortunately, Omega have spared us from printing this on the dial also. 
The main change is the addition of the text in 1965. This date refers to when the Speedmaster, albeit the ST-105.003, was passed by NASA for use on the Gemini missions. And that was following a set of stringent tests that watches from other brands failed. For me, the addition of the date is not really necessary, as the result is a very busy case back, with Omega having to shrink the font to fit it all in. One other change I noted is a move from high polish on the back of the case and lugs to a satin finish, making any strap changing marks more visible. The true length across the watch is longer than the lug to lug dimension on the old version due to the old bracelet design and this adds an additional 3mm per side of non-compliant bulk from the solid end link design. The old version was introduced along with the 1861 movement in 1997 and updated along the way to add screws for links and a double deployant clasp now 18mm wide rather than the traditional 15mm. This old style bracelet had the centre of rotation outboard of the lug, giving it an overall length of 54mm. Not only is the new case shorter lug to lug at 47mm, but with the hollow end link the entire centre of rotation is moved to the spring bar, so this new watch sits around 7mm narrower across the wrist. The hollow end link is common and already a feature of the Apollo 11 and the Ed White, and I have it on both my Planet Ocean and Tudor GMT. The trade-off being the end link is loose to the bracelet when the spring bar is removed. The other big and I'll say very welcome change is the increase in the taper to the pre-1997 design. The lug width remains the same at 20mm but the bracelet now tapers down to 15mm at the clasp instead of 18mm. This gives it a much more classic fit and one missed for so long. This one takes its cues from the pre-1997 variant that ran from 1989 but more importantly from 1968 to 1972. So it was fitted to the Speedmaster when men were on the moon. However, this was not the bracelet fitted to the ST105012 as worn by Buzz and Neil. That one had the flat link, which is why the Apollo 11 50th has it. This is a shame, as I think the flat link would have been a bit better. It looks great on the Apollo and the Ed White. There's plenty out there with Uncle Seiko and Force and the Bound versions. The original flat link had semi-elastic links, that's why you'll see astronauts with JV Champion mesh bands, which were more secure. The new bracelet is okay and I'm sure it will be comfortable, unlike the outgoing <laughs> hair puller. The Heslite version is fully brushed, with the sapphire having polished intermediate links to differentiate. The new buckle looks nice, but it's a shame Omega were unable to fit it with that on the fly adjuster as Rolex have managed to do with that narrow clasp, falling back on the two position holes. The dial at first glance is very similar to the outgoing model. All the elements are where they should be, with the familiar layout. I'm sure the uninitiated would struggle to spot the difference or describe why certain changes have been made. And unlike the Apollo 11 and Snoopy, there are no cartoons or anything new or unnecessary, just simple logo, brand and model. The main design feature Omega would draw the potential owner to its new reintroduction of a step dial. Not a big deal, and will be interesting to see how obvious this is at arm's length. The sub-registers between the chronograph second markers have been reduced from 5 to 3 to account for the beat rate from the old 321 18,000 vibrations per hour to the movement that replaced it in 1968 at 21,600 vibrations per hour, a change 50 years overdue. Otherwise the logo and text have been reprofiled, not to the vintage design as with the Apollo 11, but more to emphasise the Speedmaster text. The loom remains green super loom over, but appears to be applied into pockets rather than smeared onto the minute registers as before. And all these elements need to be checked over closely with a loop once I get my hands on this watch. Could be a long wait. Until the 50th anniversary in 2014 the Speedmaster was handed over in the traditional small red box. But in 2014 the big astronaut suitcase, this wonderfully massive and well equipped piece of theatre was included and it had inside a jeweler's loop, some spring bar tools and some spare straps. The new version appears to use a smaller style similar box to the recently introduced Snoopy 50th. Inside you get a nice removable travel pouch, a cloth and I think that's about it. No tools or straps, it doesn't even get the loop inside the display cushion. But let's face it, after a day of fiddling with the bits, yeah, it's going into storage, so no deal breaker. The box is still bespoke to the watch and a nice touch. 
So we get to the summing up and the final thoughts. Now I was genuinely excited about this watch. A watch that had its last update when Amiga's favourite brand ambassador was running around as Batman. This was long overdue by 10 years or more despite fettling with the bracelet. We saw from the first part that Amiga were constantly updating this model from 1964 before freezing it in time in 1974. But while Omega were still selling this watch in good numbers and having success with the numerous limited editions, why change? Focus was put into the 9000 series coaxial automatics and dark side ceramic watches. Omega didn't need to fiddle with this one, maybe they were just waiting for the right anniversary. But before that we needed to get the other anniversary models out of the way with the Apollo missions and the Snoopy. So here we are in 2021, itself a 50th anniversary of the Speedmaster. It's 50 years since the flight qualified by NASA text was added. Coincidence? Maybe. And not something that I've read about. So maybe the Omega marketing team who made such an important decision way back in 1971 actually missed a trick. For me, I think the changes are great. Not too much, not too little. Bringing it back to vintage, but with modern technology under the skin, without making it a pastiche of something that once was. I have no compulsion to trade up mine, Still looks the part and spends most of its time on a strap, so the bracelet wouldn't really be a factor. If I did, I think my older Hess Lite would sit quite nicely with the new Sapphire version. Yes, I can see that. Hmm. So this has been a bit of a journey. I spent the last week thinking about this watch and developing my approach, not wishing to rush and get something out. Well, I hope you enjoyed it. And the test as promised is just to kindly leave some comments at the end and to subscribe. I'm bound to have made a few mistakes, so please let me know. Anyway, I'm Andy, this has been The English Watch. Take care, and I'll see you soon. Bye for now.